Hello and welcome back to a new video. So today I wanted to talk about Spring Math Systems. Um, I made a small Spring Math System simulation over the weekend to show you how quickly you can do demos on Never Engine. Uh, this video is half show off, half um, educational if uh, you're interested uh, in the mathematics and the physics behind this. Um, but the most important thing is um, the code that is specific to this, the physics, uh, the numerical integration and stuff like that. I made that uh, over the Friday and Saturday, which means that this is all new code to show you more or less how quickly uh, you can implement uh, little demos with Never Engine. Now, without further ado, let's go into the mathematics. Now, this is, uh, as I mentioned before, a spring mass system. Spring mass systems are a hacky way to simulate soft bodies like cloth uh, and jelly on real-time systems. Uh, the idea is that you create um, like a web of vertices and those vertices will have masses associated with them. And then you connect vertices uh, between each other with springs. Uh, what ends up happening is that when you run a physics simulation on top of that, the springs will tend to make your mesh go back to its original position. And as you run a physics simulation on top of it, uh, what ends up happening is that the, the body kind of looks like it was made of some kind of soft, stretchable, deformable material, as uh, you can see as I move uh, the cube around. Now, the way that you do this is you first need to learn about a concept called Hooke's Law. What Hooke's Law says is that when you stretch a spring, the force that that spring exerts uh, onto its endpoints is equal to how much you stretched it times some number. So, for example, if you look um, as to what I'm doing here, if I grab one of these points and I stretched it just a little bit, the force that that um, vertex is going to receive from the strings that are attached to it is much less than if I stretch it a lot. And it's uh, intuitive, I find. Like, you, you do expect that the more you stretch something, uh, the higher the force of attraction becomes. Now, once you have uh, that basic idea, uh, you start by coding a simple spring class and a simple mass class, and you run a simulation with a single spring just to make sure that it works um, the way that you expect, and afterwards you're essentially ready to do more complex stuff. Um, once you manage to make something like this, where you have a wide variety of vertices and they're all attached to one another through springs, there's going to be three main things that govern how the simulation behaves. The first one is going to be damping. Damping is kind of like the friction. It's um, essentially how much uh, the system tends to move and to jiggle around, so to say. So in this particular uh, example, you've seen how much it jiggles as I drag it around. Now I'm going to make damping really high. I'm going to put it at 10. And now you can see that the behavior is completely different. The reason for that is because I've over damped the system and made damping so high that it's almost like um, this cube is immersed in honey or something really viscous. There's so much friction that there's no opportunity for jiggling. On the other hand, if I go the other way and I give it no damping, um, what's going to happen is that things are just going to keep moving around at infinitum. Uh, now, there's two things that may happen if uh, you have no damping. The first one is what you're seeing right here, which is there is no loss of energy. And so your system just keeps moving, jiggling and dancing around without ever stopping. Uh, and that is the least common and uh, the nicer of the two. 
what is more likely to happen is that your system will start accumulating energy and eventually your vertices are just going to explode into infinity and it happens fairly quickly. Um, it's very very common for this kind of simulation to just explode when you have no damping. So whenever you do this always make sure have some non-zero amount of damping. It doesn't have to be really high but have something in there because otherwise um, it's uh, like as you can see as soon as I increase damping slowly it uh, starts to go back uh, to its original shape. Now in addition to damping um, uh, the next uh, thing that you can play around with is the simulation speed. Uh, simulation speed is relatively important in that um, when you start getting numerical errors, when your simulation starts to explode and so on, making the simulation slower can a lot of the time make the system more stable and prevent many of those errors. And vice versa, making the simulation faster uh, can make uh, your system more likely to explode or to go into severe error. Um, so it is very important to try to keep the simulation speed at something that suits your needs, where it is fast enough to be convincing for your purposes, uh, but it's not so fast that um, your entire system is going is going to collapse uh, because of all of the error that gets accumulated with large time steps. Finally, the last um, thing that governs uh, your simulation is going to be stiffness. As I mentioned before, Stiffness is that number that you multiply the force by when you stretch uh, your springs. So more stiff systems tend to jiggle a lot more than less stiff systems. So for example, if I put the stiffness at 10, you're going to see this is very, very jiggly. And the reason for that is because more stiff systems are less uh, affected by damping and because they're less affected by damping, the springs tend to drive most of the simulation. On the other hand, if um, you do things slightly differently and instead uh, of uh, stiffness being really high, you make stiffness relatively low, what is going to happen is that uh, damping kind of takes over and your system tends to jiggle a lot less, although in a more smooth fashion. Uh, in general, you want to play around with all of these uh, coefficients to try to make something that is uh, convincing for whatever purposes you have. But it is not, um, it is honestly not very complicated to get um, something working. Uh, however, if you do exaggerate with them, you will get what I just got, which is your simulation will explode and you don't get anything but a black void. So I am a little bit uh, concerned that maybe the explanation isn't clear by just looking at uh, the video. So I will try to explain it with a diagram as well. Um, the basic idea, the mathematics of uh, the thing are very straightforward. The black line is what the spring would be at rest. So that is before any forces, any stretching, that is the basic configuration. Now imagine that you pull it towards the left and you stretch it so that it looks like the gradient line. Now that deformation is going to make the spring want to go back to the black uh, configuration. This will create a force that tries to pull the end of the string back to where it was. And now the formula, Hooke's law, tells us that the magnitude of that force is going to be some arbitrary stiffness coefficient k times l. And now to be clear, l is not the total length of the string, it is only the stretched portion of the length. So if you see on this diagram, the distance from the leftmost point in the black line to the leftmost point in the gradient line and that is the distance that you care about that is l uh, 
when you multiply the two, that will give you the magnitude of the force, not the direction, just how strong it is. And then to get the direction is really simple, it's just the direction of the string, and you basically have it. And then you want to turn that into acceleration. And now, Newton's uh, law of mechanics tells us that force is equal to mass times acceleration which tells us that acceleration is just the force divided by the mass. And so we get uh, the formula out uh, quite neatly, and that is the theory that uh, we're going to use uh, to actually code this. And now I am going to switch uh, into VS Code and I'm going to show you what the code actually looks like. So this is essentially how you could code something like this. Uh, you first define a mass object, uh, the only mandatory things here would be the mass and the actual position. Um, this is uh, just something that is necessary for Verlay integration. Uh, you create your spring, uh, each spring should be connected to two masses, which are the masses that are going to be affected by the forces of the spring. Uh, it has some kind of stiffness, some rest length that needs to be set up uh, when this uh, structure gets constructed. Um, and finally, uh, optionally, you can have a wrapper that just have all of your system together, especially to keep up uh, anything that is uh, global together. So for example, damping, how fast the simulation should be going, and stuff like that uh, can go here. Um, and then once you have all of these and you initialize uh, your structure, what do you want to do during the update? Uh, if I show you the update. So what you want to do during this, uh, which is what actually drives the simulation, uh, you just want to calculate the forces that the springs are doing on every single one of your masses. Uh, you store that. And once you have all of your forces, uh, you start to actually update the positions. To update the positions, you just pass, you calculate what the acceleration, the velocity, and so on need to be. You pass that onto your integration method. I personally use Verlay integration because I really like it. Um, and once you do that, uh, you calculate a new position and set it. And as you can see, this particular uh, numerical integration method is actually fairly easy to implement, which is one of the reasons why it's uh, one of my favorite. And yep, uh, I am also going to link the article in Wikipedia. And if uh, you like this video, please uh, consider giving it a like and a subscribe. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.